This is Steve Arbaro. This is the uh, Steve Arbaro Leadership Hour. Our over under. Count how many times I say my name in the next half hour. <laughs> this is the Leadership Hour. <laughs> I'll my take colleague. the over on that one. But, but see, you just pop in as if people know who you are at this point. This is Mary Gamba. I'm part of Steve Adubato and Mary Gamba's Leadership Hour. And, and the, the name has not officially changed, even though our good friend and colleague in the studio, Patrick Dunnigan, who is in fact the chairman and managing director of Gibbons PC, as actually, Patrick, let's get this out of the way. The first Patrick is our friend. I've done leadership development um, at uh, Gibbons uh, Law Firm. Patrick and I talk leadership all the time. First thing you said when you came in this studio, because you heard the end of the last show, what did you say about Mary? I said, Steve, you don't promote the fact that Mary's even on the air with you, that it's limited to the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour, and Mary should have some billing, especially in those... Uh, email that I get every single day reminding you and me of the broadcast. <laughs> See what Steve doesn't well, know I, I have actually brought Patrick as my legal counsel right now. So this is just uh, right, so an it should intervention. be Steve Adubato's leadership hour featuring Mary Gamba. Nice. Now let me say this you know a little bit about branding, do you not? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, in my other book, uh, Steve Adubato's book called You Are the Brand, there is a chapter on Gibbons and the the branding of Gibbons. Now there you is. do know in all seriousness Leadership and branding your company. Go. They go hand in hand. So for a professional services firm like Gibbons, it's a law firm, 200 lawyers, five offices, soon to be seven offices in six states, including Washington and coming this fall, West Palm Beach, Florida. Lawyers are the walking embodiment of their brand. People don't hire law firms generally. Yes, it's great to be housed in a wonderful firm with a great reputation that's been around since 1926. But my partners are the lawyers that the clients are hiring. So we have terrific roster of lawyers, and each one of them individually has established themselves as an expert in their field, a in leader their discipline. In the field? All, a, a lot of them are leaders in the field. Some, of them, some of them are are the unique leaders in the field, like you know my- Larry Lussberg. Larry Lussberg, Question, Criminal difference Defense. between expert and leader in the field? Help us understand well, that. Well, the, they've reached the pinnacle of the profession. So Mike Griffinger, for example, is the leading commercial litigator in the New York metropolitan area, in New Jersey sure. in particular. Jim Zazali, the former chief justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court, uh, is the recognized leader of the bar in New Jersey because right. of his stellar credentials. Christina Malfi is the leading go-to employment defense lawyer in New Jersey. And right now, with the hashtag Me Too movement, it's nice to have Christina Malfi around because clients are in need of her services to conduct thorough investigations and perhaps defend lawsuits, either meritorious or frivolous. You mentioned Larry Lussberg, leading criminal defense lawyer in the field. So one of the things we talk about at the firm in being the embodiment of your brand is you must do every single thing you can to protect it. You do nothing to damage your name, your reputation, indeed your brand. That leadership? Is that leadership to protect the brand of, like you have to protect the, comp the firm, the company, the organization, whatever it is, in your own conduct? Yeah. Um, so my job as the chairman and managing director of the firm is to make sure everybody is mindful of that. that You're a leader of leaders. I am a leader of leaders where you have to tell them and, and assist them in making sure they're always doing the right thing. And you put policies, practices, and systems in place so that they never transgress their own brand by accident or some other. So, for example, we have a policy on public statements. Before you can talk to the media, like I am here today, yes. before you can be quoted on a case, we have a vetting process that ensures that you can't slip up. And that is rooted in the advent of social media. Oh, so boy. we were really nervous oh. with our associates I was just early say, on. By, by the way, sorry, I'm interrupting. Patrick Donegan from Gibbons PC. We're going to talk to Patrick oh, we about millennials, that's social right. media, and leadership. Keep going, Patrick. Yeah, so that's where our policy on public statements was born. When And the advent of Facebook and Twitter and before Instagram, I was really concerned about a first-year associate who had a great time in college, bared down in law school, and then came to the firm and went crazy and, and doing keggers and, and you know chugging headstands with the big funnel. I even forgot some of the terminology, <laughs> thankfully. And this is on social well, media? That, I was always concerned about okay. that, you know, the upside-down handstands with <laughs> a funnel. That would, that would be a keg stand? Is <laughs> that, yeah, I think the it is. The fact that you know that, you're scaring me, Mary. Yes. Go ahead. 
That's so th- that's where we put the policy in place where we just said, be mindful of what you're doing. You know, be careful with, with Twitter and, and the postings. And people have gotten themselves into a little bit of hot water with Twitter, commenting about our clients, for example. <laughs> you just can't do that. When you're, when you're a law firm and you're representing a client, you owe the duty of highest loyalty. And it's not just because I represent them. Sure. The entire firm represents that client, and we all have the obligation of highest loyalty to our clients. To, to, the, by the way, listen to Patrick Dunnigan, who is, in fact, the chairman and uh, managing director of Gibbons PC, Steve Adubato, uh, here with Mary Gamba. It's the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour with Mary Gamba. Patrick Dunnigan clearly is a great negotiator, has great influence on me. He's also one of our major underwriters in public broadcasting the shows uh, that we do there. And so apparently the name of the show has changed because Patrick is here. As of this here. moment, I love it. I'm sure there's a legal team at uh, Gibbons that I can work with in terms of the rebranding of the brand. Uh, of the we, name we'd of the have show? a conflict because we've done so much legal work for Steve. That, <laughs> that is, but we can guess you a good lawyer. So, Patrick, let's try this one. Let's shift gears. Uh, without disclosing or divulging too much, because I have done so much leadership coaching at the firm, I also know you've had to make some tough decisions, fiscal decisions, personnel decisions. It's a theme that this leadership hour talks about a lot. I know you are tough. I know you have incredibly high standards. I know you and I have lots of offline conversations about that. How important is it for you to be, quote unquote, liked and popular at the firm as the leader of Gibbons versus respected? Yeah, we, you and I have spoken about that a lot. And I can say early on, when I first became the managing partner. You were a kid then. I was 36 years old when I was elected. Uh, now been in the job. This is my 15th year doing the job and of course you always want to be liked i mean that's the natural human tendency but i think you learn over the course of doing the job that it is indeed better to be respected than liked if you and and how do you get that you make decisions fairly and evenly across the entire firm that you can establish yourself as someone who is fair and that of course will get you the appropriate respect that you need now, if you have a lot of success along the way, that helps a lot too. So thankfully, Gibbons has been blessed with a great deal of success over the past 15 years. Uh, again, established in Newark in, in 1926, we've been around a long time, but this era for the firm has been a prosperous one. And it's because we've promoted, again, each of the individual attorneys for the collective good. Right. That I, we always ask the question, is it best for the firm? That's the first question that I ask, and it's the last question that I ask. And no one else is asking that question first and last because most of us are operating in our own interest. That's natural, too. Right. But but I don't. I honestly say what is the best thing for the firm. So in making some of those tough decisions, I have to look out for the close to 400 employees that work for us in, in those various offices. Yeah, but Patrick, I'm going to interrupt you in this way. By the way, Patrick Dunnigan, uh, Gibbons, PC, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, as the leader who does what is best for the firm, the team. Uh, Patrick and I happen to be big Yankee fans. I am I, too. You are too, Mary. I am, yes. Yes, you are. We, that's because we understand what's best uh, in baseball. And Joe Torrey and I have had this conversation on the air many times. Torrey would say, and I'm going to challenge you on this, when you're doing what's best for the firm and you promote someone and not someone else, someone gets the raise and someone doesn't get that raise, you are treating them not equally but fairly. The one who does not does not particularly appreciate or like Patrick Dunnigan in that moment, but you're being a leader. Go ahead. Yeah, so that that's a good example of how you have to be fair, okay? And you reward performance. So we talked earlier about policies, practices, and systems. So if you have appropriate metrics that you're using to measure performance, then it's objective and you're going to be viewed as fair. Is there always going to be a subjective component to decision making? Of course, especially in a law firm context. You know, for us, even though I'm the managing director and the chairman, I'm not really the boss. What? I'm, I'm just the first among equals. Patrick. And, and a lot's been written on this subject that, especially in professional services firms, you know, there really is no boss. But again, if you establish your credibility and you're viewed as fair, you're going to be respected and you're going to have some 
longevity in your position so of leadership. Mary, Patrick's saying something fascinating. We have a small organization, 10-person organization. I'm the CEO of a not-for-profit, right? There's no confusion as to who the CEO is. There are a bunch of leaders, but I am the leader among leaders, but I'm the CEO. Make the final call. I think what Patrick's saying, and jump in, Mary Gamba, is that you're not the CEO in the classic sense of a CEO? That's right. So it makes the wow. job a little bit more challenging. So we've dealt with that in a couple different ways. Our executive committee is fairly large. It's 10 people. They it's, have votes? They have a vote, but we haven't taken one that I can recall. <laughs> um, and similarly, our partnership doesn't vote really on anything. It's all about consensus building, about picking whatever side of the issue we're going to need, like opening an office in Washington, D.C., which is going to happen on July 1st, given the political climate here in, in New Jersey and the tension with Washington. It's strategic. And our involvement with both political parties for a long period of time, we said we need to be in Washington. So that was really consensus building. I laid out the business case. It has to be backed up with a business plan, you know, with actual paper that lawyers can read. And then go to the full partnership and present the case. And then, yeah, a vote is taken, but it's a Putin-style vote, really. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow, everyone, that's just, a first Everyone for this, goes Eva. along. A certain you know, kind it. of leadership. Yeah, I mean, it becomes manifest what the answer is because you make the case. And, you, you, you know, if you want to be contrarian, that's fine. But that's not really how we want to run our place. We want everyone to agree. I, I, but, I appreciate uh, Patrick. No, and I was just going to say, I think that works, and it sounds like it's working amazingly so, but does it ever become a type of a situation where you have too many chefs in the kitchen and you do need somebody to step up and lead? And is that the situation that you're talking about? That's when you would have to tip those scales a little bit, yeah, or think, does that not I happen? I think so. I think so. Or you, you bring along some of the other leaders, senior leaders of the firm, and then together you have a consensus and, and then you get to the right result, even if there is people who disagree. There's certainly no one who's agreed with me 100% of the time over 15 years. Sure. There's been plenty of people who disagree, but on balance, they think I've done a pretty good job and, and that the firm has been led well during that period of time. One more quick follow-up. In our organization, in our not-for-profit, we've been, I even think I talked to Patrick offline about this in one of our many conversations. I said, Patrick, we're going through a cost-cutting. We're cutting back. We're asking people to do more. We're reducing our costs in certain areas, production costs, et cetera, et cetera. Brian Berdour, who's in the studio right now, who heads up a great production operation. We talked to Brian. I think Brian called it a haircut. Are we getting a haircut? I mean, yes, well, yeah, it is. well, here's the reality. The reality is we were cutting our budget across the board and because we had to. And I'm getting to this for a reason. We also cut certain health benefits, right? Mm -hmm. You had to make some very tough fiscal decisions to, dare I say, right-size gibbons. And not everyone is sitting there going, let's hear for Patrick Dunnigan, our leader. Got a couple minutes left. Go. Yeah, so let me just take you back to 2008 when Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers went out of business. The following year, 2009, my industry, the legal industry, shed 14,000 jobs. That means 14,000 jobs. Lawyers, paralegal secretaries were lost. 14,000. I stood up in front of my employees in the fall of 08, and I told them there would be no raises in December of 08 for the following year. I told them that we would not be raising our clients' rates, that we were going to hold the rates for the following year, engendering the trust, support, and confidence of our clients. I also told them we were not going to lay a single person off in 2009, a promise that we kept. How did you know now, you could do that? Because we had done some things fiscally, like move our headquarters to you know better uh, rent and smaller partner offices. A long story that we don't okay, have time for today. Okay, but you saved enough money to protect people's right. jobs. And so by 12, Gibbons 2012. had... 2012, Gibbons had made more money than it had ever before in terms of increased revenue, increased profit. And we got to our biggest point. 2012, we were the largest we had ever been, 230 lawyers. But that couldn't be sustained in the new environment that was post-recession environment. So then we began to shrink through general attrition and then some tough decisions where we had to make decisions, ask people to move on because the legal work, the demand simply had not been there or sustained itself. The marketplace didn't support it. That's right. Which so, is what we talk about all the time. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a couple of tough years where we were flat in revenue. Profit was probably the same or a little better each year, again, because of fiscal austerity. 
And now we see 2018 as a really good year. Things are starting to chug along again. Thus, we're opening new offices. We're making new owners of the firm, equity partners of the firm. So we think we've weathered the storm and that mm. we're going to come out on the other side. But it's not easy. Every Never. single day you have to be focused on and it. And leadership is not for everyone. Uh, as I let Patrick Dunnikin, our good friend and colleague uh, at Gibbons PC go, we have been doing a leadership initiative for many years at, at Gibbons. Not every company does this. It doesn't matter whether it's our company or our leadership development firm or anyone else. It's, it's really not a commercial for us, I promise. You are committed your firm has been committed to leadership development, coaching, mentoring, seminars, one-on-one -on -one coaching. That's an investment, ain't cheap, whether it's us or anyone else. 30 seconds less on why you do that. Yeah, we created the Gibbons Leadership Academy around that same time, 2012, 2013, because we wanted to train the next generation of lawyers to be entrepreneurs, to be business developers, to be out there. So through the multifaceted ways that you talked about, we've been doing this for our young people for a long time because we saw that our partnership was starting to get a little age on it. So. It just makes sense. It's succession planning? The succession planning for each of our practice groups and for the firm as a whole. Thankfully, I'm only 51, so I've got a little bit of time left to continue to do this. But Gibbons is going to continue to train our young people so that we're in a position to offer the best client service that we possibly can. And that was a commercial. Uh, that's all good. And that's not, I appreciate that. By the way, he has a great team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you need that great team, but because you're doing it from the top down, and as you just said, with the Leadership Academy and with letting your team know that you are willing to invest in them and their development, that, that helps the team overall, I'm sure. Yeah, a lot of people talk about it, but uh, I give as they back it up. Hey, Patrick, I want to thank you for joining us. The Yankees, uh, as we do this show right now, are doing well. It's going to be a great season for them, a great season for Gibbons, and a great season for the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour with... Mary Gamba. I, I, you, you got a lot of juice with him this in the room. This is great. We'll it's be a good right day. back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand deliver.com. That's stand deliver.com. Welcome back to the uh, Steve Adubato Leadership Hour with my colleague, Mary Gamba. We just listened to our friend and colleague, Patrick Dunnigan, who leads. Pretty impressive law firm, Gibbons PC. You were just saying during the break that you took away so many things from what Patrick had to say. Go. Patrick talked a lot about the brand and that each and every person on your team needs to represent the brand of the organization. And most importantly, they need to protect that brand. We've talked a lot about social media. We've talked a lot about Twitter. When you are out there in the marketplace, even if you're just having dinner on a Friday night, you need to know that you're representing the brand of your company at all times. So that means not posting something about a client on social media, not making a fool of yourself out in the public eye. So that was a huge takeaway because I think in today's environment of everything being instant communication, people are making a lot of mistakes. And it's one thing even if they hurt you as a professional, but if they hurt your company, that's nothing good. You are listening to Mary Gamba. This is Steve Adubato. This is the Leadership Hour on AM 970, The Answer. In the second half of the Leadership Hour, you'll be checking out our series, State of Affairs, in which we talk to a whole range of political governmental leaders in the state of New Jersey about complex and difficult but pressing problems like, oh, geez, there's not enough money to do what we're supposed to do. Do we raise taxes? Do we cut spending? Do we do both? How do we fix the roads? How do we clean the oceans? Oh, you know, little stuff like that. Mary, there's something else about branding I want to follow up on. So in the book, You Are the Brand, which is the book I wrote before Yes, that Lessons in Leadership. I don't know correct. which one that was. Yeah, I've yeah. I've written but five all, books, by the absolutely. way. Absolutely. All and, on the website, yep, stand-deliver.com. Go ahead, Mary. I'm sorry. I was just going to say all on the website, stand-deliver.com. And, of course, anyone listening can follow you on Twitter, Steve Adubato, A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Facebook, Steve Adubato, Ph.D. So here's the branding question. When Patrick Dunnigan was talking about branding, I often think about the connection between leadership or being a leader and branding. There have been people over the years that I've worked with, that I've coached and mentored in other organizations and in our work as a firm that does this, and these people would have to make presentations to become a partner, to get a promotion in all different kinds of organizations, hospitals and uh, law firms and different kinds of firms, all kinds of different situations. And I'll often say to these people when I'm talking to them as they have to make a presentation to make their case in front of the executive committee or whoever the heck it is making a decision, 
I'll say make the case that you are the one who should become a partner or get this promotion. And they'll say things like, I'm uncomfortable talking about myself. I'm uncomfortable bragging. And so it's not very natural to me. And I'm sitting there looking at them like, so you want to stay where you are? Either you want the promotion or you don't want the promotion. And I never said, get up there and brag about yourself. I said, get up there, make the case that you deserve this opportunity. You've contributed to the organization. You have impact on the organization and cite specific examples. Why is that so difficult for so many people to do? I believe it's something that you learn as a young adult, most likely, that you don't want to seem like you're bragging. You don't want to seem like you are thinking that you're better than you are. But as a professional, as a true leader in an organization, you need to sell yourself. You need to sell yourself to the leaders within the organization so they know that the value that you bring is genuinely there. I think it's hard for us to talk in a positive light just because of our upbringing, depending upon... You talk about ourselves. Yeah, talk about ourselves in that light. Like, oh, you know, look at me, I'm so pretty. Or look at me, I scored a perfect score on the SAT, whatever it may be. It's just, it's very difficult to talk really great about yourself. Except here's the interesting thing. I I do not have a problem talking about myself. You You do not have, yes. (laughs) Steve Adubato does not have a problem. How much time do we have, Brian, for this? That wasn't my point. My point is... <laughs> <laughs> On Steve Adubato's Leadership Hour. Okay, with Mary Gamba. So here's what I'm really trying to get at. I've never bought into the argument that speaking about the contributions that you are making to an organization, the impact that you have on your team, the value you bring is, quote-unquote, talking about yourself in an egocentric or narcissistic fashion. But were you always that confident? Were you always as confident as you are now? We'll leave age, exact numbers out of it. Were you always that confident, even as a young professional, when you were first getting into the business? Or is that something that you learned? Well, it's interesting uh, that you put it that way. And by the way, Mary talks about age. Not everyone is 32. So um, why don't we just leave it at that? So here's what I'm getting at. And I will. it's not really a question about talking about myself is trying to use an example. I always tell sure. people in leadership seminars, if I use an example about myself, which is often about a mistake I've made mm-hmm. or something I've done that I thought was pretty good, if it doesn't offer a lesson in leadership for the people I'm talking to, then I'm not any good at this. Right. But so, for any young professional, anyone. is it? Yeah, that's, so, that's so here's my where point. We go. So back in the day, in the mid 80s, when I was 25 years of age and I decided to run for the state legislature, against an entrenched incumbent who had a ton of money, and I had absolutely no chance in the world, according to all the experts. My father, who is a very prominent political player in this state, told me, you are a stone-cold loser. There isn't any chance that you can win. Don't embarrass the family. It's not the right time. And I said, okay, I'm going to run. Now, I don't know whether you call that confidence or not. I decided to run out work the other person, who was a literally 60-year-old bank executive, president of a bank at the time, built a team and didn't have a lot of money and hustled in a way and tried to be as strategic and as smart as possible, and we won a razor-thin victory. Okay? So it's like, oh, yeah, on my bio, it says Steve Adubato, youngest legislator in the state of New Jersey. I was also the youngest legislator to lose his seat in the state of New Jersey two <laughs> years later. But here's what I'm trying to get at. If confidence means you're willing to take a risk, take a shot, and ask people to vote for you, either in a political campaign or vote for me, I want to get this promotion, vote for me, I want that opportunity, vote for me, I deserve an opportunity to make a greater contribution on this team. If that is egocentric or narcissistic, then I don't even know what it means to be a leader because if you don't have that level of confidence in yourself, even if you fall down, even if you strike out, it's like our sons play baseball and sometimes I think like in the ninth inning, if the game is tied and you're a relief pitcher, the pitcher who doesn't want the ball then, I don't want that person on the team. But isn't isn't that okay though? Because I know the show is obviously- Not to be a leader. You better want the ball 
Right. That's why Michael Jordan was a leader on the court because he wanted that ball in crunch time. It doesn't mean he made every shot mm -hmm. to win the game. It means he was willing to put himself on the line. That's what leaders do. Absolutely. It's not for everyone. Sorry. And one of our guests that we had on the show, uh, on this show, Steve Adubato's Leadership Hour, had said that not everybody is a leader. Some people are doers. So there is a place for everyone. Now, if you go back to, oh, well, should everybody be able to stand up and advocate for him or herself? I think absolutely they should be able to. But should everyone have those same skills, confidence that you had as a young adult? Or that any of the leaders that are young mm. and Bill Gates and all these other folks who did amazing things as really young adults, I don't think that's for everyone. Okay, so I'm going to disagree with you vehemently right now. Shocking. No, I, I, here's the thing. You say some people are doers. Okay, so you have a doer on the team and he or she really makes a contribution and they have a lot of value and there's a place for the doer. Well, here's the problem with that argument. Sooner or later... Steve Adubato here with Mary Gamba. We're in the studio with our colleague, Brian Brodeur, who's making things happen. He's got people on his team. We have people on our team. We coach people all the time. Here's the problem with the doer who just wants to do. Because sooner or later, there's going to be a circumstance or a situation where that doer has to step up. I'll give you an example. You have a producer on the team. He or she is a great producer technically because we run a television production company. That person is a doer, gets things done, manages the situation, all of a sudden, you have a situation on the shoot where the audio doesn't work, the lighting goes out, the air conditioner goes down, the guest isn't there who's supposed to be there, there's some sort of difficult confrontation or conflict or situation that comes up. That doer better have leadership traits to deal with a difficult situation, be strategically agile, figure out plan B and C, and have that going in. Because the doer, sooner or later, if he or she doesn't step in to lead, or in a crisis... Think about what we were talking about that uh, Italian cruise liner when Captain Shishetti yeah, when jump they hit ship. The, jump ship. Jump ship when that ship there went are down. Doer, there were doers on that. There were doers in 9-11. Mm -hmm. There were doers who turned into leaders. There were doers on that ship, uh, on that cruise line, who had to step up and be leaders because they had to get people into lifeboats. They had to figure out how to do... I don't mean it's about a crisis. I, I mean, ultimately, without those leadership traits somewhere, I don't want that person on the team. Wow. That was very passionate. I do agree with you that, yes, for our team, if we're talking just our team internally. Any team, including kids in school, by the way, who just, I want to be a good student. And that's where right. I want to be. I'm a doer. And all of a sudden you see another kid being bullied. Oh, not my thing because I'm just a good student and I want to do really well. Well, I don't want that kid being my kid. I want my kid stepping up, defending the kid who's being bullied, and challenging the kid who's doing the bullying. That's leadership. That's yeah. my view. No, but you got it. You hit it on the head right there that it is up to us as leaders, coaches, mentors, parents. We need to teach leadership. So we've talked about is leadership learned? Absolutely. There are doers that can become leaders. They just may not naturally even know it but they can be taught how to lead. They may never be as strong as some of the other leaders that are out there. Who they have some natural traits. Who have, I mean, there are so many great leaders that just have that natural ability and they emote leadership. But there are others who definitely can learn how to lead. But then there's others who honestly will always be doers. They may not be the right fit for every team, but I do believe there is a place for them as well out in the world. You do. I do. I absolutely do. I and the think, leader needs to recognize that and use them to the greatest absolutely. potential? Absolutely. I think there is a place, a perfect fit, a good fit for every type of leader, every type of business professional. And if you are a doer, that is okay. Let me tell you, uh, let me try this analogy on you. So the crossing guard, there are several crossing guards, by the way, to all the crossing guards out there who protect our kids every day, even though this is being heard in the summer. Mm -hmm. There's a crossing guard at a school where our daughter goes. She's actually leaving that school, going to the next grade. And Miss Renee, I'll give a shout out to Miss Renee. She's a great doer as a crossing guard. She does her job very well. Her leadership traits, when there is traffic at 8.30 in the morning and kids are going back and forth, running, you know, who's breaking the rules and who's parking in the wrong spot and which kid is out of control and doing whatever... Her ability to, she doesn't get paid a lot, her ability to lead in those situations with a sense of calm, with a sense of authority, and also be gentle with the kids as well, as well as being stern, she's not the CEO. 
She's a great doer who's a crossing guard, who's got leadership traits. That's what I'm talking about. And I think we are saying the same exact thing. I do believe, and it could just be in the definition of There's leadership. There's no place for the crossing guard who won't step up and lead, who's just a very good technically Technically right. good crossing and we've Sorry. all we've all seen those crossing guards that just stand there with the orange things and twirl them around and, and just say, and it's confusing because is that twirling thing stop? Is it go? I'm okay, not now, quite sure. Now you brought it. Okay, but I'm saying if that crossing guard is just right. technically a good doer, it's not really about a crossing guard. It's about a good doer scientist. It's about a good doer banker. It's about a good doer lawyer. Good doer producer in television. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, I'm saying ultimately. If that person isn't willing and or capable of stepping up and leading in certain circumstances. But it's also about being a good person, right? I mean, all mean? of these, you're saying banks, you're saying all of these. There are perfectly great jobs out there that really don't require a ton of leadership per se, but they're necessary. In the day-to-day -day job, yes. Yes. And but that's what I'm talking about in terms of those doers, because there are people that have an amazing work ethic that will work 12, 14, 16 hours a day. Yeah. And at the end of the day, and I hate that expression, I can't believe I just said it. At the end of the day, they are proud, they did a good job, but they will never be a leader, okay. and that's okay. I'm going to end it on this. A bank teller, right? He or she is very good doing the withdrawal, the mm -hmm. deposit, opening a new account. Great. Now, all of a sudden, you're dealing with a customer who's difficult, who's argumentative. you got an argument going on in the line. There's a situation in the bank. I want that bank teller to have the leadership traits whether he or she is the bank branch manager or not, but in this case not, knowing how to lead in a difficult situation, that's the superstar bank teller. And if the bank teller is just a doer and turns and goes, that's not my job to do, you got a problem. Agreed. 30 seconds, go. Agreed. And it comes down to more than just leadership versus doer versus it goes down to being a genuinely good, kind person. We've talked about it before. Who We've, also has the courage to deal with difficult situations. The courage to deal with difficult situations. The don't be afraid to run into that building when it's burning to go and That's save someone right. instead That's of running. That's leadership. Runner. That is leadership. But again, there's that fine line. You see someone on the street who's fallen down. You, you, that's leadership. Exa go out of your way to say hello to someone that you know that nobody has said hello to that That's day. That's leadership and character. And it's being a good person. That's what Mary Gamba is. She's a very good person. I'm a very good person. She's a natural born leader. She's on the air now. She's on fire. You cannot stop her. And uh, Steve Adubato, I'm just apparently it's uh, called my leadership hour, but I'm along for the ride with Mary Gamba. And we'll see folks again. What time on Sunday? Sundays at 2 p.m. On what great radio station? On AM 970. The answer. Steve Adubato, catch you next time on the leadership hour. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Roger Mashad. At Franklin Templeton Investments, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the resources that can help make higher education more affordable. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by New Jersey Resources, Valley National Bank, Summit Medical Group, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree. The New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. New Jersey Council of County Colleges. And by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by Observer New Jersey Politics and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We, in fact, are coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJDV studio in Newark, New Jersey. I'm pleased to welcome for the first time with us Tim Sullivan, Chief Executive Officer of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, otherwise known as the New Jersey EDA. Good to see you, Tim. Thanks so much for having me. Great to be here. How would you describe uh, the EDA? 
EDA is a really important part of, uh, of the state's efforts to, to diversify and grow the economy. And, and we have a, a broad set of tools that under Governor Murphy's leadership we're looking forward to deploying to, to strengthen and grow and diversify the economy, make it stronger and fairer in New Jersey. Let's break this down a little bit. Um, new governor comes in, Governor Murphy, he or she. Right. Uh, does he or she appoint the head of the EDA and then there's a, a vote by the board? Uh, makes a recommendation to the board and okay. then the board uh, takes that recommendation up, which I was fortunate to get that uh, recommendation and vote uh, back in February. Describe your background. I uh, grew up in Bergen County, so uh, born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, Bergen Catholic. Bergen Catholic, Deus Vault. There we go. Go Crusaders. And, uh, <laughs> Essex Catholic, Eagles. Our, my high school doesn't fine. even exist anymore, but that's that, another that's, story. That's fine. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Bergen yeah, County. Bergen County. I uh, went to school down in Washington and uh, worked in New York City for a bunch of years. Uh, worked for uh, Mayor Bloomberg when he was the mayor, did economic development uh, policy for Mayor Bloomberg and his deputy mayor, Bob Steele. And then uh, spent the last uh, four and a half years or so up in Connecticut working for Governor Dan Malloy. Mm. And I uh, was uh, really thrilled to get the call from Governor Murphy to come home and uh, work for the home state. Let's break this down a little bit. The EDA provides, can we say, loans to get projects going that otherwise might not get going? That's one of the things we do, sure. So uh, it provides loans and tax credits. By the way, excuse me, we're it's talking about Tim Sullivan at EDA. The website is up right now. Check out more information. I'm sorry, Tim. Of course. Uh, we do a bunch of, you know, the, the EDA has a whole bunch of tools. One of them is we can provide loans to small businesses that uh, might otherwise have ac uh, difficulty accessing the traditional banking markets. Uh, we can provide tax credits to help uh, incentivize or encourage companies to either stay or, more importantly, come to New Jersey and grow here. Uh, we can also help uh, provide you know, gap financing, you know, what does that mean? Uh, if a project is, as you described it, if a project doesn't quite make sense on its own, but there's important public policy goals, for example, affordable housing. We're working on a project uh, just around the corner in Newark where there's two two, um, two housing developments being being um, being brought out of the ground that are that have a portion of affordable housing in them, and we're helping to provide uh, some financing to bridge that gap to help to make the economics make sense for the development team. You know, Tim, <clears throat> excuse me, as we're talking about businesses in the state, so many legislators come here and others from both sides of the aisle who talk about the challenges that businesses face. They want to stay in New Jersey. They love the state. But the cost of doing business in the state is very challenging. How hard is it, in fact, to keep businesses that employ thousands and thousands of people in this state? Is it hard? Well, I'd say New Jersey has definitely a set of challenges and a set of opportunities um, that are not dissimilar from a lot of other north, you know, northeastern states. And I've had the privilege of working in other places. And the challenges... So you have context. I do have some context, yeah, from Connecticut and New York City, which is uh, sort of its own animal, but um, certainly some context. You know, real challenges and real opportunities. I think, you know, we think about the cost of doing business. That's There's both financial costs and non-financial costs. I think one of the biggest things that we hear constantly from businesses that are either thinking about coming to New Jersey or uh, making decisions about whether they should stay, infrastructure transportation, traffic, uh, those kinds of considerations. Quality of life issues. Quality of life that comes right along with it. So, you know, maintaining our uh, strong position with regard to quality of life and education and, and the vitality of our cities and towns is really important. So is making investments in higher education, investments in transportation, and particularly in mass transit. If folks can't get to and from work, They'll, find, they'll figure out a way where they can be somewhere where they can get to and from work. And so that's a big challenge, one of the reasons that the governor has been so, um, uh, so, you know, so out front and so uh, vocal in the need to invest in your transit. They need to invest in things like the Gateway Project to, to, to Yeah, we're talking about the United up. States Senator. Sorry for interrupting. United States Senator Cory Booker was with us sitting where Tim is right now. He's there yesterday. The Gateway Tunnel Project is huge. We talked about that from a federal perspective. Why is it an economic development issue from your perspective? Well, for one thing, you know, the ability to get folks in and out of, uh, in, in, into and out of Penn Station from New, York, from New Jersey is critically important. Hundreds of thousands of people from New Jersey work in the city every day, and if they can't get there, uh, they may make different decisions about where to live. Companies may begin to make dec different decisions about where to locate. Um, and so, you know, New, New Jersey has always benefited from having both a dense and highly educated population, but also a great location with great connectivity. Connectivity is the name mm -hmm. of the game in the 21st century economy. That's both an infrastructure uh, comment, but also with regard to things like, you know, internet and, and wireless capability and broadband and all those things. Uh, and so, gateway is critical. And the ability, you know, the, the last time that the new rail tunnels drilled under the, under, uh, you know, under the Hudson was, I think, 1910 or 1911, something like that. The economy is tripled in size. Aging infrastructure. Aging infrastructure. It's a problem not just the gateway. It's a problem all along the rail system. It's a That's problem right. for bridges and tunnels, uh, bridges and, and roads uh, all throughout the state. That's a really important factor that I think a lot of people overlook when they're thinking about the overall competitiveness factor for Steve, New Jersey's uh, economy. Sorry for interrupting, Tim. Steve Adubato here talking with uh, Tim Sullivan, the head of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. You see there, we'll put up their website and check out what they're doing there. So there have been conversations, questions, some say controversy. How much should the EDA do? How much should they help a business 
come to the state, stay in the state, keep them from leaving in terms of tax incentives, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what does that company owe the state of New Jersey? I mean, so I can, I can break this down in simple terms. Does the company have to commit to hiring a certain number of people and those people be from New Jersey? Like the, the ROI on this, am I oversimplifying it? No, you've got it basically exactly right. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very, very complicated, it's a very, very important um, you know, public policy set of questions because the, the notion of sort of incentivizing or inducing folks to do things that, that uh, they either would or wouldn't otherwise do is, is, is sort of an impossible question to answer precisely. Sure. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things, certainly companies, when, if they receive a tax credit, if they're getting a public investment in the form of a tax credit, we ask them to certainly commit to um, a certain number of jobs. They usually come to us and say what their plans are, what they have to commit to doing those th to those things. And the amount of credit they get, the program that exists now, which sunsets uh, about a year from now, it sunsets in, uh, in June of, of 20. It ends. it ends unless the legislature uh, extends it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's both performance-based and it's based on the number of jobs you pledge to create. So you get a certain amount of tax credit for a certain number of jobs with some bonuses built in if you're in a city, if they're high-paying jobs, if they're in targeted industries like life sciences. Mm. Um, and if you don't create those jobs, you don't get the tax credit. There are and penalties. There, there are, you never get it. You don't get it. That's a penalty. It. That's a penalty. That's right. And so you may, uh, and so companies have to perform. And so we'll see over the next, you know, there was a, a large number of tax, uh, tax credit uh, projects that were initiated in the last uh, four or five years. Some of those are going to come to fruition and come to the finish line in the next couple of years. And we'll see if, mm. um, if all those companies make, are able to deliver on the commitments they made, if they'll get the credits they, deserve, they, they earned. By the way, Tim, can people go on the website and find out who, what those projects are? Absolutely. There's a detailed list on, on our website. Make sure you go on the website. How about this one? We lose, um, I had this conversation with uh, Larry Downs over at New Jersey yeah. Resources, happens to be the chair, if I'm not mistaken, of right. the EDA, a good friend of ours. Um, and Larry was talking about the fact, and this is relevant for a lot of people, we are losing a lot of New Jerseyans, New Jersey folks who go to school here, college here, and then leave. Yep. And then they spend their life somewhere else. Tax, taxes go to another, I mean, the economic impact. The brain drain, what you, do we do? Is that an EDA issue? It's an everyone issue. And so as, uh, you know, Governor Murphy likes to think about these things as sort of a whole of government response. So EDA certainly has a role to play in it. Uh, the higher education department, my, uh, my cabinet colleague, Dr. Zakia Smith-Ellis, has obviously a big role to play in this. Um, and it, it, it's a huge long-term challenge for New Jersey to be an exporter of talent and particularly college-educated talent. Uh, talent is the sort of the, the raw material of the 21st century economy. Companies are making their decisions on where they want to be based on where they can find the people that they need. If we are exporting talent, that is a big problem long term. How do we fix that? There's a lot of things you need to do. Um, and certainly, you know, tax and fiscal policy is part of it. But I think a big part of New Jersey's opportunity ahead of it is how do we make the smart investments in our cities that are increasingly the places that young people want to be. You know, 25 years ago, people were making decisions that were more kind of suburban oriented right. and getting out of cities. And <clears throat> certainly if you, if you look at obviously New York and Philadelphia, but even in, in Jersey City and Newark and Camden in, and all across the country, there's a significant wave of investment happening in, our, in, more in American in the urban cities, areas. in the urban areas. And that's increasingly where companies want to be. Large companies, small companies uh, want to be in dense, walkable, sure. mixed-use places. New Jersey has to Two be... Two seconds, a, go ahead. New Jersey has to be in a position to compete in that. Sorry for cutting you off like that, Tim. Make sure you come back and we'll continue the conversation. Tim Sullivan has been with us. He is, in fact, the Chief Executive Officer of the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, otherwise known as the EDA. You've seen their website up throughout this entire segment. Check it out. Find out what's going on there. They're having a big impact. Tim, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate, appreciate it. it. Uh, stay with us. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We will be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined by David Sokolow, who is, in fact, executive director of the New Jersey Higher Education Student Assistance Authority, and the acronym is? HESA. It is HESA. It's HESA. It's still HESA. It's still HESA. You got it. <laughs> yeah. And t tell folks exactly what you guys do. So we're the arm of state government that helps students and their families uh, get resources and information about affording the price and cost of college, uh, post-secondary education, both uh, uh, financial resources, information, um, and strategies for helping pay for college. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. FAFSA, <laughs> F-A-S-F-A, uh, free application. Yeah, F-A-F-S-A, so it's free, free application, application for, for federal, federal student, student aid. aid. Yeah. 
what is it and why is it the key for those of us who have had young people go to college? I'm like, <laughs> this form, you got to do this. Yeah. Talk about it. So the FAFSA is the key to all financial aid. And the, the most important thing is every uh, school, every institution of public and private higher ed uses the FAFSA as the starting point. And so that information uh, tells the federal government, first of all, but then also the state through the additional state questions that are right at the end of the FAFSA, um, all of your financial circumstances to help determine need-based aid, but also aid that might be given out by the mm. school. And so um, the, uh, that's called institutional aid. Sure. Um, and so there's state aid. Um, which HESA administers. There's the federal aid, like the Pell Grant and the federal uh, programs, SCOG, other federal programs. You think there's enough acronyms? Yeah, there's a lot of acronyms <laughs> in student aid, but the key point is there's money that you don't have to pay back. That's right. called grants and scholarships. And then there's money that you do that's Those called loans. loans. And, and all of it starts with the FAFSA, which uh, is fafsa.gov. That's where you go to fill it out. So, so you know, I'm curious about this, uh, David, the whole question of, <clears throat> Not just affordability, college affordability, but the debt. Right. Are we making a dent, if you will, or making any significant improvements in the debt that young people or others, you don't have to be that young, who graduate from a higher ed institution and says, my God, I've got all this debt. A, are we making a dent? B, what advice do you have? So I think that there's a lot of efforts going on right now. We're doing some things right now um, on the student loans that HESA administers to try to make it easier to repay Your those, operation. our organization. But 90% of all the loans are federal loans. The good news about federal loans is that you can repay them as a percentage of your income. It's called income-driven repayment or income-based repayment. Lots of more acronyms. Okay, so if you're not making a ton of money, you still only pay a percentage of what you make. Right. In general, we need more people to get post-secondary credentials that will help okay. them get jobs uh, and, and help build our workforce, build our economy. In general, it pays off. The, the amount of money that you might take out in debt, you'll make more than that over, over the time. course of your lifetime. Right. And so it makes sense to take out a loan. But we need a backstop. That's what income-based repayment is, because something might happen. Someone might get sick, or they might not get the job that they were hoping to get, or it might not pay what they thought it was going to pay, and therefore they get to repay as a percentage of their income. When their income goes up, they pay more, um, but if their income is lower, they pay less. That's available on those federal student loans, and that's what everyone should take out first. We're talking with uh, David Sokolow, who is executive director of the New Jersey Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. How about this one? For some of us, um, uh, from parents out there, caregivers, who are like, all right, I've been told I have to start planning for the potential of a child of ours to go to college when he or she is like a baby. <laughs> is that? Yeah. Uh, it's a good idea. Even saving a small amount is a worthwhile thing. We at HESA run uh, the New Jersey BEST uh, program, which is a NJ BEST. NJ BEST, college savings. Um, and uh, it has a lot of uh, benefits in terms of uh, those savings. Uh, the first 25000 don't count for uh, financial aid calculation if you go right. to school in New Jersey. Um, and uh, you can save little amounts over time. And if you do that, you'll, you'll have less that you have to borrow. Um, and so uh, it is a good uh, strategy to, to save money. But you money. can't just all of a sudden go, oh, my God, I didn't realize this would be so expensive. Wherever you go, <laughs> right. you have to plan early on. You have to plan, and you also have to try to make sure that the amount that you're paying is in some way commensurate to the job that you're going to get afterwards. It doesn't make sense uh, to take on a program that you're not going to finish. Right. The biggest problems with student loans is people who uh, have debt but no degree. Uh, that's the biggest issue. You, oh, hold on. You go all the way to a certain point, David, and you don't graduate. You're not in the best position in the marketplace. But you still have that debt. Exactly. And you've got to repay that. And, and so to some extent, that income-based repayment that I discussed enables you to repay it slower with smaller amounts. But let's face it, that debt is still there. The better thing to do, obviously, is to maximize what you're getting in terms of grants, right. maximize what you're getting in terms of scholarships, what you can do with self-help in terms of uh, uh, work study, you know, get sure. jobs during term, um, but also, um, you know, having, uh, you know, the, the loans that you take out be, you know, reasonable amounts. And, and so, that, you know, we are definitely looking for people to 
um, uh, fill out that FAFSA because you don't know what all the aid you could be getting. We have um, uh, efforts in New Jersey to be the state that has the highest percentage of students filling out the FAFSA. Uh, right now we're, we're number six. Uh, we want to uh, climb up that ladder because the more people fill it out, they're amazed at the grants and the uh, scholarships that are offered. This has been uh, David Sokolow, who is the executive director of an organization that may have a long name, uh, an interesting acronym, but it is so important. We've had lots of conversations about college affordability, college debt, the loans and issues that uh, will be faced uh, later on. So one more time, can we put the website up, Jackie, one more time for the New Jersey Higher Education Student Assistance Authority. David, I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. And make sure you come back. We'll continue to talk about this. Because this, this issue of higher ed and affordability and how to manage that debt is critically important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Stay right there. Appreciate it. State of Affairs will be right back right after this. All right. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're joined by Dr. Andrea Bartoli. Dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. Good to see you, Doctor. Good to see you. So many things going on internationally. Yes, we are a New Jersey-based show, but uh, New Jersey needs to be connected to the rest of the world. Could you help us understand this? Uh, the U.S. relations right now, largely through President Trump, and its connection to our quote-unquote European allies and, uh, let's say, Canada as well. How are we doing? toward the end of June 2018. How are we doing? So, so the USA is doing what President Trump announced during his campaign. And so in that sense, it's interesting, because President Trump is just keeping his words. So the Europeans are clearly startled by this. Uh, why? He said it, and he's doing it. Exactly. So why are you surprised? Well, because this is really a departure. And it's a departure because for administration, both the Republican and Democrats, the Europeans and the Canadians were clearly the fundamental bedrock of the international system. President Trump is unusual. President Trump is an independent president, fundamentally. He's breaking away from a lot of cliché, a lot of things that were done in the past, and uh, he's exploring new territories. So he doesn't consider an alliance as the one that the U.S. had with Europe and Canada as a bedrock. He's renegotiating everything. Including trade. Especially trade. Especially trade because for him, trade speaks volume about power. So what the Europeans are uh, having difficulties is that President Trump is clearly uh, pushing a speed of change. A, an intensity of the change that uh, for the Europeans is just a little bit off-footing. So, when the president says, <clears throat> you know what, Vladimir Putin, he should be part of our group. Yes. He belongs with us. You think what? Well, I think that it's important to speak with everybody. I do fear, however, when we are speaking only or primarily to authoritarian figures around the world. I don't have any problem. Be it the leader of North Korea, be it the leader of China, uh, China the leaders right. of Russia. and, and they're, not some, they're not quote unquote democratic societies. They are definitely not. And uh, Europe is. So it's an interesting signal that you are sending around of what really counts. And uh, it's fundamentally a lesson on power. Uh, the ones that do have power, we are talking to. The ones that are procedural, the ones that are participatory, the ones that are truly democratic, well, we are not that interested because in many ways they are weak. But Dr. Bartoli, by the way, this is Dr. Andrea Bartoli, uh, Dean of the School of International Relations and Diplomacy at Seton Hall University, the other way around, but we'll see it up there. Is there a risk, or what is the risk by saying, you know what, yes, we've been together with these European countries, France, Germany, um, uh, England, and, and also Canada, et cetera, et cetera. But you know what? I don't think we need them so much. Is there potentially a time, An Doctor? Loaded question. I know that we really want to go to them, and they're like, "Wait a minute, but, you didn't but, treat us right." But there is an enormous risk even further. The question is, what is the world you want to live in? So you want to live in a world in which everybody's robbing everybody, or you want to live in a world in which everybody's respecting everybody? 
Well, power is interesting because, of course, I have a certain power if I have weapons, if I have the capacity to harm you, to steal from you. But what about actually having a village in which the roads work, a school works, mm. the light works, and so on and so forth? So it's really an issue of what is the world that we are anticipating? <clears throat> are we living in a world that is really just a power game, or are we living in a world that is about respecting, that is about what do you encountering. Think? You're asking a rhetorical question. I'm asking it because I think that the world that we are creating is the world that we have inside. And this is why it's so important for us to cultivate actually our own values, our own commitments. Our being citizens of the nation or citizens of the world? Both, both. Because we are in a way now very clearly building the world as we go. You were speaking about New Jersey before. Yes. But New Jersey is the world. There is no doubt that you have, you know, the Prime Minister of Portugal coming to see the soccer game. And down in the ironbound section and, of Newark because and, 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 there's so many course, Portuguese who live exactly. in the ironbound. It have, is the world. And then you have, you have the largest Indian uh, city outside India dressed right here. You know? and, right. you have, and my family came from Naples. And, and, and please, you're, you're, you came from a different section of Italy, did you I'm not? I'm definitely Roman. So I, how here did I, I am. know that? <laughs> how did I know? We're different so, paillets. But the but point is that New Jersey, New Jersey is really the world. So it's connected. We can't, so excuse me for interrupting, Doctor. Is it dangerous for us to be so provincial and say, this is New Jersey, we just care about ourselves? But or it's America? Just, but it's, what I'm saying is that it's just impossible because everybody's already here. You have a lot of people from all over that are already here. You have Hungarians here, you have Somali here, you have Nigerians here, you have Chinese here. Hmm. So I think it's important actually to take New Jersey very seriously and to see the politics and the policies that we are experimenting here may have effect actually in a lot of places. We are in a moment of humanity in which we can learn from one another in a way that we couldn't in the past. But from the way you get your garbage to the way you do your education, from the way you do transportation to the way you welcome people, you are actually setting the tone, not just for New Jersey, but right. for the world you want to have. Brother Steve Arbato here. We're talking with Dr. Bartoli from Seton Hall University about a whole range of international issues. I have to do this. As we speak right now, the immigration issue is complex, confusing. As we speak, literally, the whole qu at the end of June 2018, the whole question of babies, children being separated from their um, parents. Is that a diplomacy issue? Very is it a much. negotiation? What, what is it? Very much. So it's, first of all, these choice, is human choice. You know, laws are human choice, borders are human choices, interpretation and executions are human choices. Excuse me for interrupting, Doctor. As we speak right now, the President is saying, it's the law, don't ask me, I'm just following the law. Well, he's also saying we can review the law, and so it's also important to see what is the opening that he's offering. So it's, impossi it's impossible to think the crisis unless we try to find a way out. Could we do an overruling and changing the, 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 the law about immigration? Of course, I believe that this is what the country should do. And definitely, it's not easy politically, but it's something that a state like New Jersey should consider. Let me ask you this. We're I said when we're taping toward the end of June. This show will be seen after that. If you were predicting it, would you say that we are, in fact, going to take on a meaningful discussion and real changes in immigration policy we have for the better? To. We have to. We have to. For if we do not. Um, America, economically, politically, needs a lot of migrants. Uh, it's absolutely necessary for America to grow, to be great, to actually have a very significant, meaningful conversation on immigration. And the pathway to legal immigration. That's, that's the issue that you need to have when you have president, Congress, and states together. And this right. is why America really needs to come together. Dr. Andrea Bartoli, dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, originally from beautiful Roma. Thank you, Dean. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank Check you. out next time on State of Affairs. We're in Newark, not Rome. <laughs> <laughs> State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by New Jersey Resources, Valley National Bank, Summit Medical Group,
N.J. Best, the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, New Jersey Council of County Colleges, and by International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. <laughs> This is absurd. Insurance fraud costs every New Jersey family over $1,300 every year. Report fraud at njinsurancefraud.org.